Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Non-Toxic Environments Podcast. This is Andy Pace, your host. This is a another fantastic week. We're going to be talking about cork flooring, actually the iteration of cork flooring, where it came from, how we got here, and what it, what the future holds with cork, uh, not just flooring, but in general, in production all over the world. Uh, I had a, a wonderful opportunity a couple of months ago to meet with um, – the, the ownership of Amarim Cork uh, with Antonio. And he was so gracious with his time. And our guest today, Kelly, is one who actually set this up. And I've been looking forward to having Kelly come on the show ever since then, because there's so much more to talk about when it comes to, to Cork and how we can incorporate it into our projects. And so... Um, Kelly, please, uh, um, thank you, first of all, for coming to the show, and please let us know exactly your um, your your job with Amarim and, and uh, what you do every day. Yes, thank you, Andy. Um, as you said, my name is Kelly Downs. I am the country manager for Amarim Cork Flooring here in the U.S. Um, so I basically run the flooring division and there are several divisions of Amram, but I'm just the flooring division um, across the entire U.S. Wow, that is a um, that's a daunting task. <laughs> that's <laughs> I can't imagine. I have a hard enough time with just the the um, few employees that I have. Uh, I can't imagine working with stores. Uh, I assume you work with retailers. You also get involved with specification work um, and, and so forth. That must be um, a, a ten hour day for you every day. At least simply because Portugal, who I work directly for and with, are five hours ahead of me on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And then covering the entire U.S., of course, you know, the West Coast is three hours behind. So the phone typically starts going off about 3.30 in the morning until about 9, 9.30 in the evening. Um, and it's it's never boring. But yes, to your point, um we work through retailers. We do not sell directly to consumers. So we work with a lot of retailers. Um, we really try to partner with people. We don't, we're not everywhere. We're not trying to be in every retailer. We want partners who understand how to sell a natural product, a sustainable product, the health benefits of cork um, and those types of things. So we also work with a lot of designers. My background is interior design, and I was a commercial sales rep for, for many years when I entered the wonderful world of flooring. And um, so we call, you know, basically on end users, um, designers, and mostly retail partners at this point. So a lot that you said there, we're going to talk about because, okay. I mean, full disclosure to everybody listening, I've been selling cork flooring specifically from your company for close to 30 years now uh, in various iterations of the of the material. And so I, I like to talk about some of those as as we have our conversation today. But to start out, very, very basic, cork production, cork material, uh, I think most people understand that cork is, you know, comes from a tree, but, you know, in a, in a quick uh, synopsis, how does that process happen? So exactly. So unlike hardwood floors, for instance, we never cut down the trees. As a matter of fact, um, it's illegal to cut down cork oak trees in Portugal. Hmm. You, it's, you're, you're not allowed. The fines are huge. Um, it is a protected species and it is a cork oak tree to your point. A lot of people don't even know that part. So basically what happens is once a tree is 25 years old, it can be harvested. It, that cork, that bark of the tree can be harvested every nine years. And that actually adds by doing that, we it benefits the tree and extends the life of that tree to 200, 250 years. It's really, really incredible. Um, a fun note is that the, the, the tree harvesters are the highest paid agricultural job in the world mm -hmm. because it's actually an art form to be able to understand how far to cut into the bark because as the tree ages, that bark grows thicker. Mm -hmm. And um, 
And so they need to know exactly how far they can put that tool in and how high up they can go into the tree without compromising the health of the tree. So it is um, a very lucrative, lucrative trade, especially for Portugal. And it is a very, very specific trade. As a matter of fact, the blades they use they cost about $100 US dollars, but in Portugal, that's a lot of money, right? So they actually take better care of those um, blades than most of us, you know, do anything, in, unfortunately, and they pass them down from generation to generation. So when you go visit the cork oak tree, you can go right into the forest, right up there. They'll ask you if you want to try it, which is very intimidating. And, um, and they basically bark the trees and it goes, our the, the forest we use primarily is more in Lisbon, which is about maybe three hours from Porto where our manufacturing facilities are. So everything is very, very close. Most of our court comes from Portugal and that's where our, like I said, our facilities are. But basically the only place that um, cork oak trees, we, we call it expand. So when the bark, think of popcorn in that sandy, dry, hot temperature, it creates this expansion in the cork, I mean, in the bark, and that's where you're getting the cork. And that only really happens in certain parts of the world, only truly in the Mediterranean basin is the easiest way to say it. So Portugal, a little of Spain, the north of Africa, the south of Italy, France, that area and that Mediterranean basin is where most of the world's cork comes from because it's the only place that really allows for that expansion that you need to actually punch cork stoppers out of. And that's where it all really began, right? Um, mm -hmm. The use of cork. So um, it takes about three harvests to get that cork expanded enough to punch cork stoppers out of, which is Amram's primary business actually, um, and where we got our start. But so it takes, so those first two harvests, sometimes three, um, we never waste any of that bark. It's never wasted. They will um, grind it down. It becomes, we're, we're the cork in the bottom of Birkenstock shoes. It's the infill that they're using to infill um, sports um, arenas and really what we, what they call football in Europe and we, we call soccer here in the US, I believe. 2016 in France was the first games that they took out all of the recycled rubber because it was causing health issues. It holds heat. It's not good for impact. Um, and they are replacing stadium by stadium that with, with the cork. So nothing ever goes to waste. There's always a use for every bit of the bark that comes off of those trees. And like I said, they, they do it every nine years. So they'll, they'll whatever they harvest this year, they'll put in the number four. They'll paint it in white paint on that on that tree, and then they'll know in nine years they can come back and harvest that part of the forest. Wow! So fascinating. It is fascinating. I just my my head's just going through all these different scenarios of um, of this process. But so the the most valuable part of this is going to be wine stoppers, and so I I know this from years ago. I would tell my cu customers. You know, first they do is core out the stoppers and everything else gets then ground up and turned into, you know, flooring and fishing rod handles and, and sh you know, um, shoe inserts and all that stuff. Right. Um, several years ago, there was a, uh, a situation where I believe there was like a series of fires in the warehouses and it caused a... Uh, a little bit of a disruption in the cork industry that year because we lost a year's of harvest. And mm -hmm. at that point, I remember stories coming out like, oh, you know, we're running out of cork. Um, this is a, a limited supply and this is going to be a problem from this point forward. So um, if you if you recall that or have some information on that, I'd love for you to give us your um, opinion on that, because I think that really gave people the wrong impression of where cork is. A hundred percent. And the funny thing is I wasn't selling cork at that, at that point. So I wasn't around for it, but I have, I have heard about it and <laughs> I questioned it because the beauty of cork and, and the reason, part of the reason it's illegal to cut the cork trees down in Portugal is because it's a natural fire barrier there. The ecosystem relies so much 
on the court floors because they have, you know, it brings water to the surface for the animals. Um, and it's a natural barrier against brush fires because it'll smoke like crazy, but it doesn't burn. Mm. It takes, it, it's got a very, very high heat tolerance. And um, so I, I believe from what I understand is the fires did more damage to the production facilities yeah. Right. Then it's going to to the cork. And um, I believe the wrong message. <laughs> imagine that the wrong mm. message was sent out. Um, we're in no way. Going to run out of cork. Um, it's a natural, renewable, recyclable, biodegradable product that it's illegal to cut the trees down. The trees are never cut down. Um and yes, there's, there's things that can happen. If you're talking about a natural product, they can always happen. But I think from what I understand and what I have um, garnered from asking these types of questions is that it did more, more damage to the production lines and, um, and companies' abilities to, to actually make other things, to, to grind the cork up and to, to make things with it. Because when we bring it in, it's, it's, you know, it's got half circle basically, right? It's it's round and it's steamed um, so that everything lays flat. So you're talking about machines that are needed um, to, to assist in the production part of it. And I think that that's where the true damage was. Mm -hmm. um, I know for, for Amram specifically, it took a few years to, to recover from that and get back to um, being the largest producer of cork in the world. You know, it's interesting when, when you actually hear the real stories about, behind these things, you know, yeah. it's like a story years ago that came out that said that um, there's radon in granite countertops. Right. Well, well, I was a kitchen designer then. <laughs> yeah, right. So come to find out that that particular study was paid for by a manufacturer of quartz. Mm -hmm. So, you know, a lot of the information we get out there is just misinformation. Now, yes, there were these uh, issues happening at the production facility, the fires and so forth that shut down the facility, but it didn't cause such a disruption. I believe that this particular message was really being promoted by the uh, the vinyl manufacturers. A hundred percent. And I feel like to this day, it's still a little bit on us in that, of course, with the age of social media and and the savvy marketing that that happens these days everybody can jump on a narrative and they can manipulate that narrative to their advantage and that's the way our world works at this point um and i think that for us it's a little bit on us simply because we allow the larger companies to um own that 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 narration of of sustainability and health and and those types of things so i mean for me in all honesty any that's why you know i'm i'm very very pleased that you wanted me to join you today simply because it's just getting the word out it's just educating people and every time we go into our partners into these retail shops you know they're so excited to be able to have something that isn't what everybody else has mm -hmm. that's a natural product that has health benefits and of course, nobody in any other part of the world talks about sustainability like the U.S., which always surprises me um, because a lot of other countries are kind of naturally there anyway. But um, we talk about the sustainability part of it. And it's it's just for me, um, it's a bit of a gift to have sell, be selling a product that's naturally sustainable. It just, it was that way. We didn't do anything to make it sustainable. We're not buying points. We're not doing any of those things. We've been around for 153 years, just making cork products. It's interesting because it seems like companies like yours and a few others that I can think of that I've worked with over the years, the ones who are truly not just providing the message of sustainability, but this is what you do. It's like you, you are... You know, Amarim is like the poster child for sustainability when it comes to manufacturing, uh, design, manufacturing, distribution, so forth. Um, and sometimes it's more difficult for a company like yours to talk about sustainability because you've been doing this for 153 years. Your company has, 
and this is just inherent in your everyday actions, you haven't hired a team of 30, you know, PR people to put together a message that can sell. Right. And that's exact. That's exactly it. This is like, like you've said, I mean, this company is 153 years old. It is run by the fourth generation, uh, Mr. Antonio Amram, who you had the pleasure of meeting and, and interviewing. And you, you could tell just from that conversation that his life is cork. It's preserving. It's the, you know, it's the economic um, value that it adds, um, not just to Portugal, but all over the world, because we are a global company. And again, our number one company right now, and it does change, um, but is the Cork Stopper division. And, and to put that in context, we produce 27 million Cork Stoppers a day. And a lot of those machines are our own innovation, which is part of the draw to me to this company. Not only is it a fascinating product, um, and who knew in the flooring industry that you could come across such a fascinating product. Um, but there's, but we, you know, we own in that in that market share of cork stoppers over sixty percent of that market. So, so much of that is doesn't need a story. It doesn't need PR. It is a self, you know, perpetuating you know, product and material. And in the flooring division, as you know, and I know, especially in the US, we're a consumer driven economy and the marketing and the PR matters. Owning the story matters. Now, I'm not saying that that we don't understand that. When they first came to the US on the flooring division, they went through distributors, which of course is what you would do in a foreign country where you don't have a staff and you're, you know, you're trying to get it out there. Unfortunately, in 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 those days, it's the height of the LVTs and the SPCs. It's that those are a very easy sell, and you lose the story because what sells our product is the story, is the health benefits, and um, and the sustainability again just came naturally. And so, um, so that's something that you know we we've changed about four years ago started going direct, having direct sales reps and um, a little bit of a different team dynamic here in the U.S. to really get out the education, get out the the, the conversation. We do have cork lovers in the U.S. Um, one of my favorite stories was speaking to um, a very, a, a very well-known um, commercial um dealer in in the u.s all over the u.s actually and he was like well i've never heard of cork tell me about cork so you know my favorite story to tell i was very happy to tell it and he stops in the middle of everything and he says no 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 no. i do know cork i put cork in jackie o's kitchen it was the only material she would use in her kitchen <laughs> and wow. so it's been around for a very very long time it has um it has a very large audience in Europe, not so much in the U.S. I always say we're the best kept secret in the U.S., but you know, I feel like we're 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 gaining ground. I feel like as much as um, COVID changed the world and changed our views, I think now more than ever, people are looking for a a healthy alternative. You know, they 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 are moving away from the plastics and in, in, in all forms. You know, now natural materials are back in, you know, and um, responsibly sourced as a, as a word and those types of things. And again, we have been there for, we've owned that story for 153 years. So a couple of things I want to touch on from that. One is um, you've mentioned it a few times, and I certainly, obviously our listeners are, are really interested in this aspect of it, the health uh, of cork, you know, why would somebody want to use cork in their home versus a traditional wood floor, a tile floor, or a vinyl floor? Um, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, it's it's both the the comfort factor because, as you mentioned, cork expands, uh, and that's what gives you that. Uh, ability to have a little bit of cushion, a little bit of of sound deadening, you know, feels better on the joints, stays warmer longer, you know, in cold climates. Um, but also the fact that cork contains a natural um, sap, let's call it. I think it's called Subaran. 
uh, that is naturally resistant to um, mold and bacteria and uh, um, so forth. So uh, am I right on those things? Yes, you're 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 totally right on those things. As a matter of fact, that's why it is one of the number one products used in flooring in children's bedrooms in Europe because they don't want to put carpet. It's it's naturally antimicrobial. It's naturally an air purifier, and just like you said, the thermal attributes of it. It's warm. It's quiet, and the easiest way I think to explain it, um, because I'm a layman, I am not. I'm not a very, very highly technical person. Um, But the easiest way to explain it is if you took cork and you looked at it under a microscope, it looks just like a honeycomb. So for like every one cubic centimeter of cork, there are, I believe it's 40 million cells. So it's crazy. And within those cells is what is, is what you just called. It's more of a gas that's in there that traps the sound. It traps all types of things. It's what makes it a natural air purifier. It's what gives it that, think of a cork stopper, that compression. So if you you can stand on it for long periods of time, it's one of the largest um, um, uses in hair salons and things like that in Europe, retail stores where they're standing on their feet for long periods of time. So all of those aspects, we don't add anything to it. It's just the cork. Now, of course, it's the way ours is constructed, right? Our, our Some of our flooring and, and we have multiple layers of cork. It's just not one. We don't just slap cork on a, on the back of a, a, you know, of an LVT and say, you know, it has all these benefits. There are multiple layers. So that's really what sets it apart. And the health benefits um, are, are the fact that it is the antimicrobial, the fact that it is a natural air purifier, the fact that, you know, I came from retail where we put, you know, LVT in people's homes and then they'd come back and say, my house is now cold and loud Mm -hmm. (laughs) and um, I break everything I drop and those types of things. Where cork is that perfect hybrid. It's actually better um, on impact resistance than carpet, according to a study we did in Germany a few years ago. So for people like myself who drop their phones and everything else regularly, I, it's it's fantastic. Um, but it's also the sound attenuation, you know, in the room um, and, and those types of things. So to me, I contribute that to comfort and overall health. Well, without a doubt, I think as a as a uh, architectural consultant, I'm constantly looking for ways to improve. Uh, the the health of the occupant number one, but also uh, I had a client a couple of years ago coined the term a quiet house, and what yes. what he means by that is a home that's not only quiet, you know, from an audio standpoint, but quiet from a disturbance standpoint, whether it's um, um, you know shock absorption, uh, chemical um, emissions, um, electromagnetic field um, dispersions, and so <laughs> forth. So cork is one of those products we look at all the time to help create that quiet home. Exactly. And I get that a lot, especially post COVID when everybody was working from home, you know, they did not, they, they needed, and I mean, I have six kids and two dogs. So, so I covet some quiet. I mean, they're all grown now, but I truly understand that, that challenge. Um, and the way our products are made, you know, you have the, the cork underlay, which is really going to help you with the footballs in the room or upstairs, you know, I I wear nothing but three inch heels, so I can't sneak up on anybody in any other type of flooring. Um, And so, you know, it really helps with that type of sound attenuation, but because all our products have a very, very thick layer of cork at the top, that is what I call, that's what I call where the magic happens because that's the sound attenuation in the room. Cork, again, we've talked about the thermal attributes of cork, and I can talk more about that because we have amazing examples, but that is where you can get up in the middle of the night, run to the bathroom without having to put your slippers on and your socks on because your feet are going to get cold because cork is, it's, it basically mimics the, um, the heat of your body, not it doesn't, it's not going to get cold, not the, not the, the coldness of the room. Um, we actually did an energy savings, um, report a couple of years ago when, when, especially in Europe, when the, the war started in Ukraine and energy 
prices were spiking, um, we always talked about, okay, well, you could save energy. So let's quantify that. And um, with our products, you can save up to 17% on your energy bills. So there's so many factors. Again, it's the education, it's understanding it and knowing it. But those things are what attribute to um, to the overall you know, health and, and well-being in a home <laughs> and a bank account. But also where that thick layer of court comes in is when you drop things on it. That's what's giving you that resiliency. Um, you move a piece of furniture and anything else, you're going to see a dent or a divot. But think of a cork stopper. You leave it for a couple of days and it's it's going to come back. It's going to it's going to pop back up. Now, you know, if it's a piano or an elephant, it's not going to come back 100 percent. It's you need to put a little something under there, but it's going to come back probably 70 percent. So I always say this is a performance product. It's not a commodity product. It's not your LVTs and SPCs. It is something like a natural product, like a hardwood that you're going to have for a much longer period of time. And the thing about even manufacture, the manufacturing process, you know, if you're comparing these products, it, it we sequester more CO2 in the production of, um, and I mean like, 17 times the amount in the production of cork than you do even with hardwood. So, um, and we're not cutting down trees. So there's just so many factors between the health and the environment. And I think that those at this point in time are, are hand in hand. For sure. So one of the the myths of cork you just debunked, which is that, oh, cork is so soft. And this is, of course, promoted by the 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 vinyl industry. Cork is is too soft and and therefore it's going to dent. It's going to it's going to look bad. So obviously you debunk that. It's got a memory structure to it. Right. It, it right. rebounds back to it's mostly its original shape. And so uh, while you may see a dent for a period of time, that usually goes away. Um, so one of the other uh, myths about cork, and I and I don't understand where this comes from, but people will say you shouldn't really use it in an area that gets wet. And my response is twofold. Number one, wine stoppers, you know, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> Number two, I remember doing a job in Japan many years ago where we used cork to completely line a shower. You know, wow. uh, and it's very popular over there to use cork in a shower because it stays warm longer. It's very comfortable. It's very quiet. It dampens the sound of water, obviously. And mm -hmm. so that worked out beautifully. That's done all the time. And so that's another myth about cork. And and uh, we just had a, cust a, a, a question in the chat. And Judy's asking if, if it's porous, would it absorb mold and mold spores? No, because it's antimicrobial. So mm -hmm. they can't grow on it. Now, I think there's been a very, very good marketing campaign around waterproof, waterproof, pet-proof, life-proof, all of these things, right? Um, I'm not a huge proponent of that because quite frankly, if you get water under anything, you're replacing it. Yeah, It just is what it is because there's other components that are on that floor other than our floor, right? So, um, so that is something that I get a lot as well. I tell people, absolutely, can you put it in a bathroom? But like anything else you're going to put in a bathroom, I would put a bead of silicone between the shower or the tub and the floor because the whole point is not getting water underneath anything that you're putting in your home. Mm -hmm. But it's the bark of a tree. <laughs> so if it wasn't going to stand up to water or elements, the tree would not be lasting 200 plus years. Mm -hmm. So to what you just said, the... Um... The fact that um, most companies these days are promoting waterproof flooring as a retailer of flooring materials, as well as a consultant, I can tell you there's no bigger um, gotcha question than is your flooring waterproof? Because yes. as you say, the flooring itself, water may not affect it, but everything underneath will be affected. And so unless you're doing four inch cove base with, um, you know, a, a completely monolithic material that can act as a as a tub, uh, if water ever spills, then your subflooring is going to get ruined. Exactly. And I, I mean, like I said, before I came to Amram, um, I ran a, a retail company and 
I can't tell you how many, you know, they all, everybody wanted waterproof floor. This was the height of, of, of the waterproof everything. Mm -hmm. And we would have these floods on the East coast in the spring. We can have some crazy, crazy rains. And I remember one particular year was very, very bad. And I can't tell you how many phone calls I got. Hey, you just put this flooring in. Um, you know, we took it up, we had to dry out the basement, but now I need new flooring because of course, once you take it up and it's, you know, some of these thinner plastics and things like that, you've, you've compromised the locking system. They're not going back in. So that was, that was a brilliant marketing campaign. <laughs> I'll leave it there. It sure was. It <laughs> sure was. So I like to say everything is water resistant. If you spill I something, no, your floor is not going to be ruined. Mm -hmm. Wipe it up. You'll be fine. It has a varnish class 33. Everything's commercially rated mm -hmm. that we sell. So, you know, yes. I say the exact same thing, Kelly. And I think that I probably turn some clients away from buying once in a while. And I'm okay with that. I would rather have, if they're going to buy what they think is a waterproof floor from somebody else and that other company is going to just gladly take their dollars in two years, when they have a problem, they come back and they say, well, you told me it was waterproof. Um, right. I would rather have all this information at the outset to say, sure, the floor is water resistant, but it's not going to protect anything else. So just let's make that clear. Uh, sometimes they just need to, near, need to hear the term waterproof, and that's a sale. Uh, you know, I, I can't do that in good conscience. Um, so... The way Cork used to be, when I first got into this business 30 years ago, we were selling Cork that was, uh, what, three sixteenths of an inch or, or so thick, mm -hmm. solid, just solid granulized Cork, and we had to glue it down. Yes. And it was beautiful. And, and folks, if you think about, if you've ever been in an old um, library or bank building that was built around the 1900s. They probably still have the original cork floors down because they look beautiful. They they last forever. Just absolutely wonderful floor material. But it, they became out of sort of out of favor in the industry when carpeting and plastics came about in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. So that glue down cork, though, while wonderful in all those aspects, was a pain in the butt to install because of the curling and so forth. You had to have really specialized installers. And then came the floating floor, the whole concept of gluing together a floating material, then eventually it became a click and lock. So, you know, talk to me a little bit about this, this iteration of how it's changed over the years. And because to me, not only is it uh, making it easier for people to obtain, but it's also even strengthening your original sustainability asset because you're using less and less of the actual valuable cork, right? Yes and no. Um, because the new products will be, we're, we're digitally printing it directly on the cork. That's true. Yeah. So, right. So, um, and, and I think that that is a, a very, very good question because it's very much part of our story and where cork is headed. Um, you would be surprised at the demand that is resurging for glue down cork tiles. The mat, we call those what you were talking about, massive cork tiles, which I will be stocking in the US again because the demand, especially in commercial commercial um, applications, like you said, the, the, the library at Harvard, the vestibule at Harvard, um, is massive glue down cork. And even in that outside part where it can be 117 degrees because there's no ventilation or anything, no heat, no HVAC, um, it gets very, very hot and they have massive glue down cork tiles there. So we'll be bringing those in, but to your point, it's a very specialized installation. But once you put that in and then you varnish over the top of it, you have a bulletproof floor. As a matter of fact, I do stock um, some four millimeter glue down cork for walls and floors in the U.S. But last year we did the um, the Westminster Abbey Chapel in a glue down cork that is the champagne color that is absolutely stunning. Mm. So it's still very much part of our business because cork is our business. Now, it definitely changed. And at this point, we have like you said, the floating floors um, in cork visuals, as well as wood visuals. And, um, and, and that, again, 
you know, I think that the surgeons of the floating floor and the, and the the ease of the install and being able to install over everything, you know, it's it's like everything else in every industry. We evolved, and but what I love about such a natural product, it's like the linens and the silks that are back in. Um, it's the same with court. Now suddenly there's this resurgence in, and I get every week I get requests for massive glue down cork tiles. Mm -hmm. Now where we're going right now, we have, you know, a few different products here in the U S that are floating. Um, and our next iteration is, um, you know, kind of that sustainability we talked about before where we've always been sustainable, but there's always room for improvement, right? So we've set a goal, I believe it was last year to be completely plastic free by 2030. So that includes plastic around our boxes and our packaging. You know, there's plastics in things that you you really don't think of. We had a couple of products that are on um, an HDF and they still have a little bit of PVC in those. So we've gotten rid of all of those. So we are now completely PVC free across all of our product lines. And then um, the next iteration will be our new product line that is not only PVC free, it's completely fossil free. And you were able to see that at Surfaces, we'll be launching it this year. Um, it's a product that we call Bio Natural because it's completely bio-based product. So not only is it a floating floor um, and it still has the click system, very, very easy to install. It's very beefy. It's nine and a half millimeters thick. Um, so it's it's competing very, very well with with hardwoods right now, actually. And um, in some of our our um, our specification work and um, and the core is what we changed in that product. So all of our products are PVC free. We have a few different cores. Um, and then the bio natural core will be made up of, of cork, which all of our products are, of course. Um, it's a patented um, um, rigid core with the cork, minerals, um, like limestone. And for the rigidity, in some of our other products, we have recycled HDPE. In this product, we're using the waste from sugarcane to create that 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 rigid core. So it's it's a revolutionary product, completely patented. Um, and I always say it's our market disruptor. I've been saying it for a year. I've been shouting it from the rooftops. I'm so excited to, to bring this product to the U.S. in this timing, no less, um, with legislation and things that are happening around the environment. Um, but I, I liken it to when we went from the BlackBerry to the iPhone. Nobody blinked, right? Yes, mm -hmm. it's a higher cost but it's also a product that doesn't exist anywhere else um, in any market. There's no other marketing narrative around it. And um, we're really, really excited about that product. Then after that, like I said, by 2030, it's becoming completely plastic free in everything we do, even our packaging. So while our products are naturally very sustainable products, um, there's always room for improvement. And like I said earlier in this conversation, part of the reason I'm drawn to this company is the innovation, is they're never, they're never happy. I mean, we were, we were doing well, we had our digital print machines, um, but they were like, no, 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 I think we can, I think we can digitally print directly on cork with a 3D registered embossed seven layer varnish that, that creates this absolutely stunning product that is good for our environment. It's good for our families. You know, it's, it's, it's fantastic. We're very and, excited. And uh, I could not tell the difference when it was put down on the floor. I could not tell the difference between that and a real, I, I would call a real wood floor. I mean, cork is real wood, of course, but it, it right. actually looked like a white oak floor. Um, you had to literally get down on your hands and knees and and almost look at it from the edge to even know that it wasn't a solid wood floor. So it's very impressive, uh, a wonderful feel to it. And, you know, as you say, in the latest article I wrote about this, I call it an industry disrupting technology. And I, and I think it's industry disrupting because yes. I believe that there are so many companies out there who refuse to go down this path of using more sustainable natural materials because of, you know, the, the dollars involved. Right. 
But what they do is they just say, it's not possible. We can't get the performance out of a natural material that, than we can out of a synthetic manufactured product. So they just refuse to even try. And, right. you know, when I was talking with Antonio at the show, when, when we were talking about this technology, I mean, he was just smiling, just ear to ear grin, because he said, you know, we're proving that you can do this and this. And so we just set the course, we're going to do it. And so I look at every other flooring manufacturer is looking at Amram now saying, well, I guess, you know, cats out of the bag. Now we can't hide the fact that we're trying to ignore this technology. Absolutely. I mean, and, and it is not inexpensive to your point. I mean, that was a 8 million euro investment on our company's behalf to, to get us this technology. Um, and other people have bought that same machine since, and you'll, you'll start hearing more and more about um, this digital print technology, you know, that kind of thing. We will be the first to market successfully with it. Uh, we will be the only to market with a truly sustainable product like we have. Um, and so that's exciting. I don't think we've, I don't think any of us have ever been more thrilled to be the underdog here. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. So uh, the, the, the million dollar question, when do you think we'll start seeing these products in the stores? I would say uh, I'll have it in the U S late April, okay. early May. Um, and then we'll be rolling it out because people just from the show have already ordered displays. I don't know that I'll be able to roll it out fast enough. We might need a small army, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we're, we're really, really excited. So I'm going to bring that product in and I'm going to bring it in in wood looks and in stone looks that are amazing. Right. I do have a, a product line now um, that has the stone looks and where that is doing the best in the market is in tiles, tiles, places because people don't want it you know they love tile they love the resilience um and the longevity but they don't want their floors to be hard and cold and loud and have grout lines mm -hmm. and in these you don't so we're we're very very excited and we can't get our hands on it fast enough right for sure and and just you know so everybody knows too because i know we have a we've been selling your products for many years and we have many clients that have you know, just in the past few years, installed the 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 um, uh, wood wise and the cork wise in their homes. That's not going away. I mean, we're still going to be selling that product. We still absolutely love it. It's it's still one of our right. best selling flooring materials that we have. It's just that this new version is just going to be kind of over and above that, and I think it's going to be adding um, a benefit for certain applications that you can't get out of the other one. And so, um, yeah, we'll be, we'll be, you'll be supporting both, at least for the, for the next few years, I assume. Yes, we will be. The Wise products, to your point, are our number one sellers in the U.S. in project and in retail. So those, I really didn't change anything about our, our product lines that are existing, just because what we need is the stability, right? right. Um, you know, we have it out there already. We do not, we are not a huge company. I do not have a thousand salespeople across the United States you know, there's, there's five of us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, like I said, we're very intentional. We create partnerships with our companies um, because we want people, we want our ultimate customers, the consumers to, to have a good understanding of the products that they have and, and, and the benefits and things like that. So um, we'll be rolling it out. We'll be keeping the product line that we have. We will again, evolve the Woodwise to the new digital print. As a matter of fact, we're copying some of those colors now to make sure that we can still keep the same look of the line, nice. only it'll be a little bit thicker. Um, we're gonna add to the quality. So for me, if you're gonna change, you gotta change for the better. It needs to be an improvement. Um, we need to be bringing value to our partners and our, our, our customers. Uh, we cannot wait to get those displays here in our showrooms and, and uh, we know it'll be another winner of a product from Amarim. Uh, Kelly, first of all, thank you so much for, for your time today. And I'm sure everybody is enjoying this conversation as much as I am. This is, this is wonderful. Is there anything else that we missed that uh, you might want to touch on? I don't think so. I really appreciate the time and everybody who joined us today. That was, that's, that's very nice. And, and, um, and if anybody has any questions, of course, that we didn't, we didn't get to, I, 
I can't see them, but I'm happy to answer them. And again, you know, I appreciate the time, but just would love to say that Cork is not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, I know it was popular there for a while, but to your point, people were kind of saying it went away and we won't have it again. Our company um, actually just invested in 8,000 acres um, of Cork forest to, to, continue. We'll be planting more cork trees. We will continue the tradition um, and the legacy of, of Amram for a very, very long time. You know, at, I'll, I'll just say this with my interview with Antonio. He was very excited to talk about that project. Uh, you're going to be planting 1.5 million new trees in the next five years. Yes. And what's really amazing is this is not going to pay any dividend to Amram whatsoever for at least the next 20, 25 years. And probably so, longer. Yeah. But, so we won't be able, we have to plant them. We won't be able to harvest them for 25 years. Wow. But then again, you're not getting that expanded cork. Right. So probably more like 40 years if you yeah. really add it up. Um, Yes, I remember when he first purchased the land and we were all in Portugal for a meeting and the land had vineyards, which we own vineyards as well. If you ever have the chance to um, try Portuguese wine, I highly recommend, especially <laughs> from our vineyards. Um, but it had horses and cows. And I said, Mr. Hammer, what, what are you going to do with horses and cows? He's like, I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he'll think of another business venture because he's good that way. Right, because he's cork. Exactly. <laughs> yes. So so he knows where he's going to plant his trees. And yeah. um, yes, yeah, so so it it was the investment not only in our division of the company, but the but the company's future is is always going on and it's it's something that they never hesitate to make. Um, and I, I truly respect that about this company. Well, exactly. And I respect the fact that they are willing to literally put their money where the mouth is. And they're, they're not just a company preaching sustainability and so forth. They're, they're actually, sh again, showing the rest of the world how it's supposed to be done. And I applaud them for that. I, I, I do as well. I'm, I'm happy to be a part of it. And I'm happy you're one of our partners as well. Thank you. Well, again, Kelly, thank you so much for being on the show today. And just so everybody knows, this will be coming out as a audio podcast and then a video on YouTube thereafter. So uh, look for those recordings coming out uh, soon. And uh, again, thanks again for coming this week. We'll talk to you all again next week. Take care. Thank everyone. you. Thank you.